the two path factors of right resolve and right concentration very closely related. Right resolve is the intention you have in mind. You basically lay down the law for yourself that you don't want to think in unskillful ways because that leads you to acting in unskillful ways. And as you're able to start thinking in more and more skillful ways, it's easier to get the mind into concentration. At the same time, concentration helps give strength to your resolve. As the Buddha pointed out, you may see very clearly that sensuality is uncomfortable. Excuse me. Sensuality is unskillful. But you still go for it. And what you need is the pleasure that comes from right concentration. That gives you something else to hold on to. And this principle carries through all levels of the practice, even from the very beginning levels. You need to have a good pleasure to overcome your desires for unskillful pleasures. This is how you can start sorting out things in the committee of your mind. Because when you've got the mind in right concentration, you're working with the breath, which is usually the part of you that gets hijacked by your creed, aversion, and delusion. They can start getting you to breathe in unskillful ways. You can even have panic attacks. They just squeeze the mind, squeeze your nerves, as they say in Thai. The more you end up doing something you had intended not to do. And so you're basically taking the breath back. So at the very least, the unskillful thoughts don't have that avenue open to them. So you want to learn how to breathe in a way that's skillful, comfortable, feels good inside, feels nourishing inside. And get so that you can tune into that, tap into that, access that, any time of the day. It's good, it's good to stop at random times in the day and ask yourself, where is a comfortable breath right now? In the very beginning, you get a very clear sense of how you wander away from comfortable breathing so easily, and yet it's so nearby, and it can do so much good for you. So it's good to be able to take that practice. You, you stop for a second and say, I'm not going to do anything until I get that comfortable breath back, and then see how long you can carry it. Because that's an important tool in counteracting the unskillful members of the committee. Because then all I have to deal with is the thoughts. When an emotion feels strong, it's because it's taken over our breathing and it changes your heart rate, changes the way you digest things. All kinds of things get changed in the body through unskillful breathing. And then you feel that you've got to give in that unskillful intention, just to get rid of all the, the symptoms you're feeling in the body. But if you can retake the breath, they don't have that avenue open to them. And then all they have is what they tell you. Now they're going to tell you some pretty scary things, some pretty clever things on their part. And this is why we have a right view, and this is why we listen to the Dharma, so that we can have some techniques to counteract their strategies, but you also have to learn how to think them up on your own. This is what the Buddha talks about heedfulness. Well, what kind of things can you think about that remind you to be heedful, that if you give in to this particular type of thinking, it's going to cause trouble down the line? And learn to Talk to yourself in that way. Develop that voice in your mind. Make that a commi committee member as well. There's the element of pride. There's skillful pride in the practice. Here you are, been meditating X number of years, and you're still giving in to that. 
You're still giving it a desk. Why? Why on earth? That goes together with that passage where the Buddha talks about different things that you can have governing your practice. One is a love of yourself, that you came to the practice because you really went to happiness, and here you are going back to something that's not so true. Do you actually love yourself? If so, why are you doing this? Then there's love of the Dharma. You're lucky that you found the Dharma. Are you going to give up this opportunity? And then there's that third one. He said, the, he says, taking the world as a governing principle. There are people in the world who can read minds. What kind of mind state are they reading in you right now if they happen to be paying attention to you? Do you have any pride at all? You want to make sure that you're, at the very least you're struggling with the unskillful states and not just giving in. There's compassion. You realize that if you give in to unskillful states, you're not the only one who's going to be suffering. Because as your mind gets weakened, it makes you more of a burden on others. So lots of different ways you can think and get around whatever arguments those unskillful voices are shouting at you, whispering at you. But right resolve is the part that lays down the law. And often this is something that's overlooked. We tend to just go with the flow and say, well, I shouldn't hold on to my views too tightly. But that gives your, your defilements all kinds of room. So you remind yourself, you know, sensuality, the, the kinds of thinking that just keep going over and over and over, sensual pleasures that you've had in the past or sensual pleasures that you'd like to repeat in the future. It's something you really want to avoid. You really want to learn how to get past that. Then there's the resolve not to hold ill will. Some people find this easier than others, and you find this easier in some cases than in other cases. But you want to make it across the board. You don't have any ill will for anybody, no matter what they've done. And then finally there's the resolve not to be cruel, not to be harmful to others. The, those two go very closely together. Lack of ill will usually gets translated into goodwill, and lack of cruelty gets translated into compassion. And of these three forms of right resolve, the, the latter two are the easiest to see that they would be good things. Even if you can't bring yourself to follow through with them, you can, it's easy to see that they're good. It's that giving up sensuality, that people have a lot of problems with that one. Think, why well, can't, what's wrong with sensual pleasures? I mean, are you saying that sensual pleasures are, are evil? Or, you're dissing an important part of human life. Well, you have to think about, okay, what happens to the mind when it keeps going over these things over and over again? One, it gets, makes it harder to get into concentration, and two, it's a bound to have an impact on your, your activities. If you give an essential thinking a lot, you tend to find that your precepts start getting sloppy. And particularly the little precepts, and this applies especially to monks, the little precepts are the first to go. As you start get slop, as you start getting sloppy about this kind of thinking, and you tell yourself, "Well, that doesn't matter," but it's important because once the little ones go, then it's easier for the the big ones to go too. So again, this is why it's so important to have that alternative to tap into. On the one hand, using your insight to get past these things. In other words, pointing out to yourself the drawbacks of unskillful thinking, unskillful resolves, and the advantages of learning how to abandon these things. And then having something that you can fall back on that really does feel good. Because so often we think of renunciation, we think of starvation, pain, deprivation. 
And the Buddha says we have to learn how to see renunciation as peace. Now, how do you do that? You do that by giving the mind a really good, comfortable place to stay. This is why the first stages of right concentration include pleasure, rapture, more pleasure, more rapture, more refined pleasure, and then the pleasure of equanimity. The mind needs something to feed on, and these stages of concentration are your food. Then when you've got better food to feed on, it's a lot easier not to go back to the old stuff. In the beginning it may be hard. You find yourself sneaking back for your cheeseburgers or whatever. And this is when you have to keep warning yourself, okay, what a cheeseburger is going to do to your system. No, it's the same with greed, aversion, and delusion. That's junk food for the mind. And learn to think about these things, not as your friends, but more as false friends. The kind of friends that come and say, hey, let's go and get into a little trouble. It won't be too bad. And then the police come and catch you, and they, they go running away and they leave you. It's one of the John Lee's images. In other words, they're not responsible at all. These voices that come whispering in your mind, they're not responsible for the, the suffering that can come about through giving in to them. In fact, they go running away when the suffering comes. So you have to learn how to look at these things as your enemies, as traitorous friends. And learn how to look at concentration as your true friend. Look at the breath as your friend. You've got to win the breath back so, it's, it, does, so it doesn't serve as a servant for greed or aversion or delusion or jealousy or fear. So that you can tune in to good, comfortable breathing anytime in any situation, and that's your first line of defense. So these are some of the ways in which you can get some control over that committee. You lay down the law, and then you give yourself good reasons to stick with it, and then you reward yourself for sticking with it. That way you train your committee so that the unskillful members get starved and the skillful members get strong. And that's how right resolve, combined with right concentration, can help you stay on the path.